Chapter Nineteen of Planet of the Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. Chapter Nineteen. This was a floating golden ball looking like a schoolroom globe in space. No clouds obscured its surface, and from this distance it seemed warm and attractive set against the cold darkness. Brion almost wished he were back there now, as he sat shivering inside the heavy coat. He wondered how long it would be before his confused body temperature controls decided to turn off the summer adjustment. He hoped it wouldn't be as sudden or as drastic as turning it on had been. Delicate as a dream, Leah's reflection swam in space next to the planet. She had come up quietly behind him in the spaceship's corridor, only her gentle breath and mirrored face telling him she was there. He turned quickly, and took her hands in his. "'You're looking infinitely better,' he said. "'Well, I should,' she said, pushing back her hair in an unconscious gesture with her hand. I've been doing nothing but lying in the ship's hospital, while you were having such a fine time this last week, rushing around down there, shooting all the matchster. Just gassing them, he told her. The Nye orders can't bring themselves to kill any more, even if it does raise their own casualty rates. In fact, they are having difficulty restraining the Dissons led by Ulv, who are happily killing any matchster they see as being pure Umedverk. What will they do when they have all those frothing matchster madmen? They don't know yet he said. They won't really know until they see what an adult matchster is like with his brain parasite dead and gone. They're having better luck with the children. If they can catch them early enough, the parasite can be destroyed before it has done too much damage. Leah shuddered delicately and let herself lean against him. I'm not that sturdy yet. Let's sit down while we talk. There was a couch opposite the viewport where they could sit and still see Dis. I hate to think of a matchster deprived of his symbiote, she said. If his system can stand the shock, I imagine there will be nothing left except a brainless hulk. This is one series of experiments I don't care to witness. I rest secure in the knowledge that the Nyorders will find the most humane solution. I'm sure they will, Brion said. Now, what about us? she said disconcertingly, leaning back in his arms. I must say you have the highest body temperature of anyone I have ever touched. It's positively exciting. This jarred Brion even more. He didn't have her ability to put past horrors out of the mind by substituting present pleasures. "'Well, just what about us?' he said, with masterful inappropriateness. She smiled as she leaned against him. "'You weren't as vague as that the night in the hospital room. I seem to remember a few other things you said, and did. You can't claim you're completely indifferent to me, Brion Brand, so I'm only asking you what any outspoken Envarian girl would.' Where do we go from here? Get married?" There was a definite pleasure in holding her slight body in his arms, and feeling her hair against his cheek. They both sensed it, and this awareness made his words sound that much more ugly. "'Leah, darling, you know how important you are to me. But you certainly realize that we could never get married.' Her body stiffened, and she tore herself away from him. "'Why, you great, fat, egotistical slab of meat!' What do you mean by that? I like you, Leah. We have plenty of fun and games together. But surely you realize that you aren't the kind of girl that one takes home to mother. Leah, hold on, he said. You know better than to say a thing like that. What I said has nothing to do with how I feel towards you. But marriage means children, and you are a biologist enough to know about Earth's genes. Intolerant yokel, she cried, slapping his face. He didn't move or attempt to stop her. I expected better from you, with all your pretensions of understanding. But all you can think of are the horror stories about worn-out genes of Earth. You're the same as every other big, strapping bigot from the frontier planets. I know how you look down on our small size, our allergies, our hemophilia, and all the other weaknesses that have been bred back and preserved by the race. You hate— But that's not what I meant at all, he interrupted, shocked, his voice drowning hers out. Yours are the strong genes, the viable strains. Mine are the deadly ones. A child of mine would kill itself, and you, in a natural birth, if it managed to live to term. You are forgetting that you are the original Homo sapiens. I'm a recent mutation. 
Leah was frozen by his words. They revealed the truth she had known but would never permit herself to consider. "'Earth is home, the planet where mankind developed,' he said. "'The last few thousand years you may have been breeding weaknesses back into the genetic pool, but that's nothing compared to the hundreds of millions of years that it took to develop man. How many newborn babies live to be a year of age on Earth? Why, almost all of them. A fraction of one percent die each year. I can't recall how many. Earth is home, he said again gently. When men leave home they can adapt to different planets, but a price must be paid. A terrible price is in dead infants. The successful mutations live, the failures die. Natural selection is a brutally simple affair. When you look at me you see a success. I have a sister, a success too. Yet my mother had six other children who died when they were still babies, and several others that never came to term. You know about these things, don't you, Leah? I know, I know, she said, sobbing into her hands. He held her now, and she didn't pull away. I know it all as a biologist, but I am so awfully tired of being a biologist, and the top of my class and a mental match for any man. When I think about you, I do it as a woman, and can't admit any of this. I need someone, Brion, and I needed you so much because I loved you. She paused and wiped her eyes. You're going home, aren't you? Back to Anvar. When? I can't wait too long, he said, unhappily. Aside from my personal wants, I find myself remembering that I'm a part of Anvar. When you think of the number of people who suffered and died, or adapted, so that I could be sitting here now, well, it's a little frightening. I suppose it doesn't make sense logically that I should feel indebted to them, but I do. Anything I do now, or in the next few years, won't be as important as getting back to Anvar. And I won't be going back with you. It was a flat statement, the way she said it. Not a question. No. You won't be, he said. There is nothing on Anvar for you. Leo was looking out the port at Dis, and her eyes were dry now. Way back in my deeply buried unconscious, I think I knew it would end this way. She said, If you think your little lecture on the origins of man was a novelty, it wasn't. It just reminded me of a number of things my glands had convinced me to forget. In a way, I envy you, your weightlifter wife-to-be and your happy kitties, but not very much. Very early in life I resigned myself to the fact that there was no one on earth I would care to marry. I always had these teenage dreams of a hero from space who would carry me off, and I guess I slipped you into that pattern without realizing it. I'm old enough now to face the fact that I like my work more than a banal marriage, and I'll probably end up a frigid and virtuous old maid, with more degrees and titles than you have shot-putting records. As they look through the port, Dis began slowly to contract. Their ship drew away from it, heading towards Nyord. They sat apart, without touching now. Leaving Dis meant leaving behind something they had shared. They had been strangers together there, on a strange world. For a brief time their lifelines had touched. That time was over now. "'Don't we look happy?' Hiss said, shambling towards them. "'Fall dead and make me even happier then,' Leah snapped bitterly. Hiss ignored the acid tone of her words and sat down on the couch next to them. Since leaving the command of his rebel Nyord army, he seemed much mellower. "'Going to keep on working for the Cultural Relationships Foundation, Brion?' he asked. "'You're the kind of man we need.' Brion's eyes widened as the meaning of the last words penetrated. "'Are you in the CRF?' "'Field agent for Nyord,' he said. "'I hope you don't think those helpless office types like Fossil or Merv really represented us there. They just took notes and acted as a front and cover for the organization.' Nyord is a fine planet, but a gentle guiding hand behind the scenes is needed, to help them find their place in the galaxy before they are pulverized. "'What's your dirty game, Hiss?' Leah asked, scowling. "'I've had enough hints to suspect for a long time that there was more to the CRF than the sweetness and light part I have seen. Are you people egomaniacs, power-hungry, or what?' "'That's the first charge that would be leveled at us if our activities were publicly known,' Hiss told her. That's why we do most of our work under cover. The best fact I can give you to counter the charge is money. 
Just where do you think we get the funds for an operation this size? He smiled at their blank looks. You'll see the records later, so there won't be any doubt. The truth is that all our funds are donated by planets we have helped. Even a tiny percentage of a planetary income is large. Add enough of them together, and you have enough money to help out other planets. And voluntary gratitude is a perfect test, if you stop to think about it. You can't talk people into liking what you have done. They have to be convinced. There have always been people on CRF Worlds who knew about our work, and agreed with it enough to see that we are kept in funds. "'Why is it you are telling me all this super-secret stuff?' Leah asked. "'Isn't it obvious? We want you to keep on working for us. You can name whatever salary you like. As I said, there is no shortage of cash.' His glanced quickly at them both, and delivered the clinching argument. "'I hope Brion will go on working with us, too.' He is the kind of field agent we desperately need, and it is almost impossible to find. Just show me where to sign, Leah said, and there was life in her voice once again. I wouldn't exactly call it blackmail, Brion smiled. But I suppose if you people can juggle planetary psychologies, you must find that individuals can be pushed around like chessmen, though you should realize that very little pushing is required this time. Will you sign on? Hiss asked. I must go back to Anvar. Brion said. But there really is no pressing hurry. Earth, said Leah, is overpopulated enough as it is. End of chapter 19 End of Planet of the Damned